our next speaker, which is also digital. So now we will welcome Dr. Tara Garnett, who is the director at TABLE and based at Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University. And hope we can see you now, Tara. And if you, everyone, turn around and wave, I think Tara can see our faces for a moment <laughs> before you will see our necks while we look at you. So uh, the, t the screen and the space is yours, Tara. Morally welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really sorry that I can't be here. I, I was going to be, I was fully intending to be, um, but I try not to fly. Um, I was going to take the train, but I couldn't get a sleeper, the sleeper train, um, even though I tried booking a month in advance and the day trains just took too many changes. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so the theme of this session is transformation. And when I was told that, I was frankly quite terrified because it's a very, very big word, and I'm not an evangelical preacher, I'm not Elon Musk, and I'm certainly not a British Prime Minister, so that word is very daunting. How does one change the food system? And the more I thought about it, the more I started to think about, well, what does that even mean? Um, and before I go into my talk, um, again, I wasn't able to hear the presentations earlier today, but I, I understand that it touched upon a whole range of concerns, including, including the environmental. But while I'm here, I just wanted to put this one slide um, up, which is taken from my colleagues at Oxford, our world in data, who do great data sort of visualization work. And I just wanted to remind everyone of the scale of the problem, which is probably extremely familiar to us all. We do have a problem. So the question is, what does transformation look like? Um, but that's not so simple either, because the question is, what is actually the problem? And I think there are different approaches to thinking about what's really fundamental to the, the food crisis that we face and the sustainability crisis that we face. I think from one perspective, one could see the problems we face as those of um, insufficient innovation, insufficient technical ability, which could be um, addressed by more research and investment, more research and development, more focus on the technologies and the innovations that are going to deliver the changes that we need towards net zero, zero hunger, and so on and so forth. Another approach takes as its starting point the fact that that's not what really the problem is. The problem is that uh, there are too many of us that are too greedy on this planet and that we what we really need to do is tread more lightly on the planet and consume in ways that are less resource hungry. And then a third way of thinking about what our real problems truly are is, is to say that it's actually it's problems of in, inequality and and injustice and that that we need to be addressing the social and the political and the economic structures that drive the the problems that we see today and of course most people will say well it might be a bit of this and it might be a bit of that as well but but i think when we when we talk to people when we all go about our business and talk to people uh, we'll see that stakeholders researchers practitioners members of the food industry policy makers all have their biases towards different conceptualizations of what the problem is. And because of these different conceptualizations, I think they give rise to different understandings about what transformation looks like. It's a transformation in what, to what. And to take us some examples here, we've, we've heard uh, Professor Sunstein talking about um, uh, Pepsi Max, actually, I've got, I've got uh, Coke Zero here. And, and Marie Chantal talking a bit about uh, the importance of, of innovation. So from one perspective, transformation could be delivering that fun, that um, enjoyment, that taste that we all know and like in ways that are um, less, um, less unhealthy or less environmentally demanding. And that suggests um, a focus on innovation, and, and certain forms of kind of technological solutions. For other people, success might, might be seen in very, very different ways. It might be a move towards um, a more radical configuration of 
what we eat and how we relate to the natural world and and how much space we take up on the planet and that's perhaps the top left hand side of this um this visual um where we're talking about uh, rewilding afforestation and the shift towards more plant-based foods a third perspective might might talk about more of a sort of an agroecological perspective where the problem is that we we don't farm in harmony with nature so that that suggests the need for things like agroforestry um a shift towards sort of proper more old-fashioned meals the reintegration of crops and livestock in the food system and then another perspective might say actually what we need is we need a bit more of that innovation that we've seen with the sort of the shift towards Coke Zero and all the rest of it, but we need to scale it up really, really dramatically and move to technologies that are still very much at the, um, you know, at the drawing board and at the lab stage. So these are different ideas about what transformation looks like. And, and so I think I think we all need to think about this before we start talking about how we might achieve that transformation. But that's my only slide that I'm going to talk about what, what do we mean by transformation? Because I think what I'm really interested in was the, you know, the question I've been asked to, to address, which is how does transformation happen? And and I'm I think I think there are very ways you could look at it. So um that different ways of thinking about it. So it it might, and, and they will vary. It might vary from your disciplinary lens. If you're a neuroscientist, you might be focusing on a very different understanding about what motivates behavior, what motivates change um, from someone who's dealing, um, who is a sociologist or he's dealing, who is dealing with organizational theory. So how one understands change to happen is going to, 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 to be very much founded in, in, in how, what your sort of ed educational starting point might be. How one understands change might also depend on the scale of attention that you're focusing on. Again, it could be on the sort of biological mechanisms that drive our behaviors and our changes, or it might be focusing on um, local communities, or it might be focused on the sort of very, very large scale processes of change that are linked to globalization. And in each case, there's going to be different theories about how change might happen. And another way of thinking about change is the context in which change happens. So that could be the context could be the home, it could be the kindergarten, it could be change at the farm level, it could be change in the food manufacturing sector, it could be change in our in our governance systems, in the processes of um, of kind of um, organizing policy. So again, you're going to have a different understanding of what what change is there um and then i just thought for the other the other blobs on this presentation i'd go into a little bit more detail i, I mean i think the agent of transformation is another is another way of thinking about who who is the change maker who is the change doer and and there are different assumptions about that often um we we seem to be hearing most of the time about the consumer, the idea that the consumer is the is the 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 changer in in the food system by his or her uh, consumption decisions, um, the choices are made and and therefore change happens or does not happen, and that therefore the focus should be on encouraging or making the consumer make better, cleaner, greener, healthier choices. Another way of thinking about the agent of transformation is that it's not about the, the person as a citizen, as a consumer, but the person as a citizen. So this is the role of civil society that we identify differently, not as not, not as members of the market economy, but as members of um, a global citizenry. And that gives rise to different ideas about what change ought to be and how change happens. Um, another way of thinking about change is that the agents are actually corporations, that they hold the keys to transformation and that they are 
that we are we as the individual are, are mindless dupes sort of um uh, manipulated by the advertising and the persuasions and the power of corporations that's another very very different understanding of um of, of who is doing the change and who ought to be doing the change and then we have other other understandings as well the idea of financial institutions and indeed capitalism holding the keys to to to, to transformation the media and particularly social media and of course government institutions and you can look at that at various levels from you know the local authority to to the city to to national and international governance mechanisms so all these are different ways of thinking about um, who's doing the change. And of course, we all know and love um, these sorts of um, diagrams, which show how it's actually everything, everywhere, all at once, which is a title I stole from a, a very good movie that was recently out, um, which is worth seeing, um, that, that it's all these things all at the same time. But, but where do you make your point of intervention? and with which agent and that's sort of how how do you who goes first as it were and of course you could think about the agent of transformation the person or the or the institute or the institution that does the changing but then you can flip it around and say well actually who is the target of transformation so i as the uh, government representative who do I focus on with my interventions? Do I focus on the corporation? Do I focus on the consumer? Do I focus on the financial institution? So uh, as an agent, who do you focus on? So again, that's another um, another question to ask when thinking about, um, about change, like who, wh where is your priority for, for action? And then we have different ideas about how change logically happens I mean I think you know I'm sitting in a research institution and and if the implicit theory of change in a research institution is if you increase knowledge then knowledge will need to action but if you know we know that doesn't necessarily happen there's another theory of change that is if you make people feel the real need to change through um uh you know a picture speaks a thousand words documentaries movies etc cetera, etc cetera, then that will lead to change another theory is that if you incentivize or disincentivize people um then then that is itself a mechanism for change so if you if you reward people or if you penalize people or institutions or or companies and then the the sort of the fourth one which sounds a bit tautological is the idea that change leads to change if the context changes then your attitude might change and just to give us an example when um before the introduction on the ban on smoking in public um in public places um i can't remember the exact figures but it was something like 50 percent of the british public was supportive of a ban on smoking in public places once that ban was introduced the number of the, the proportion of the British public that was in favour um, rose dramatically. So when the context changes, your knowledge of the issues and your feelings about the issues will also change. And again, all those logics are based on ideas about what people are really like. People are really good or they're really selfish. They are really rational or they're really irrational. They're really powerful or they're really powerless. That they're important or that they are irrelevant because wider forces are much, much more significant than the norms and structures and systems that, that shape what it is we eat for breakfast and, and how we go about our daily lives. And then, and then linked to that, the idea that we make conscious choices as opposed to we are, um, we are simply creatures of impulse, habit and context. So I think I think when one thinks about how change happens, it's important to think about what the what what the assumption it assumptions are cognitive and emotional um, that that drives that 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 theory of change. And I think also when thinking about change and indeed what change really is, the moral lens is also quite interesting. We've heard a lot again about how how change transformation needs to be linked to for example fun 
or the idea that foods are aspirational or or somehow engaging to to people that's one way of thinking about it but i think another way of thinking about what change what worthwhile change really is is the extent to which it engages us with our intrinsic values perhaps our kind of deeper moral principles and again to give to give an example from about outside food um you could you could uh, tell your children that for every a grade they get you will give them you know you will give them some money um and they may well get lots and lots of a grades or you might tell your child that it's worth trying really really hard to do really really well because learning is worthwhile in and of itself they be, they might both deliver results or the the, the the bribing with money might work but will it work in the long run so i think i think there are different theories and again people fall on different sides of that debate on which is the most effective way of delivering change and and again once you get to that level to that change whether whether it's the, the sort of change you really really want which goes back to my earlier slide which is you know what does good look like what does transformation actually look like um and then of course we have other very very sort of classic um theories of how how change um could be made to happen which is the the classic nuffield council of, on bioethics ladder ladder of intervention and then the work um uh, undertaken quite a few decades ago by Donella meadows of the uh, limits to growth report who was looking at um different ways of thinking about change with the most fundamental change being the the changes in the mindsets and the paradigms that govern the system again the the, the paradigm or the mindset that governs our current system is still very much based on the ideas that growth is good choice is good and so on and so forth that the individual is 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 king or queen um and again uh would an alternative pr paradigm give rise to a very different kind of food system so what where is it within the food system um that you would want to intervene when it comes to the sort of the the kind of nuts and bolts of the system the sort of altering the flows the and the taxes or the incentives and the disincentives as opposed to moving further up that that set set of um set of ways of thinking about change to focus on mindsets and values and principles and driving principles. Um, so I've offered some thoughts on how change happens, but I think I have probably already blurred into um, the confusion of the difference between how change happens and how we think it ought to happen. And, and I think I think we confuse that a lot, actually. Um, I, in the absence of quite a lot of evidence that we perhaps need about how changes happen, we think about change that's what change is actually legitimate. So, you know, on the one hand, you have a, a way of thinking which is that govern, government should govern, they should be more robust, they should take out, uh, action, they should set a regulatory framework versus a whole load of discussions about the risks of the nanny state. Um, again, there's focus very much on the individual, which for some people could be seen as empowering or necessary, as opposed to another way of seeing it, which is, you know, stop blaming the individual for obesity or for the environmental damage that's being caused or whatever. Um, ways of thinking that say, you know, we must harness market mechanisms to a way of thinking that says that, you know, markets are part of the problem, they're inherently self-serving, they're not going to deliver the fundamental change that, that we need and we go back to governance um, or indeed, um, you know, a, a, a anarchy or whatever, whatever might be your, your political theory of choice. Um, and then, and then again, the, what, the, the question I've been thinking about, you know, throughout this presentation is what change is, is actually really and truly changed. And so that's partly, you know, what does good look like? and linked to that it's the idea that we should be focusing on incremental solutions so um working with the mechanisms that we have to hand um 
uh, as opposed to another way of thinking that it is never going to get us to the really structural changes that we need, that it's a sticking plaster job and that it, it actually might be propping up a system that is fundamentally rotten. That's a different way of looking at it. Um, and um, which leads on to the sort of idea that we need a total transformation in the food system versus the, the accusation that those sorts of statements are are hand wavy at best. They're just hopelessly vague and and lead to nothing practical at all. So I think we have a lot of a problem with the the is ought contradiction when talking about change because we all have our own pet theories of what what change ought to look like and how it ought to be made to happen. And what we really have, and this is um <laughs> this is a set of um these ideas about policy making are I think stolen from Tim Lang um, when I heard him talking a few years ago and I don't even know if it's he's in the audience if he is I hope so um, but but Tim once said something that we see in at least British government we see policy making because of the evidence which is quite rare we see a lot of policy making in the absence of evidence we see policy making despite the evidence suggesting we should be doing something completely different and we also see a lot of nothing at all, no policy action at all, despite the evidence that action should be taken. And so we get into this vicious, vicious cycle of nothing happens because there's no evidence, but no, there is no evidence because there's no policies that would drive the changes that would actually gather the evidence. And I really, really think it's time to break that cycle. So in a sense what i would suggest how does change happen it would change by ignoring pretty much everything i've said in this presentation and just going out and experimenting because i think we don't have time for anything else really um time is passing and our problems are are mounting so um that's all i have to say thank you thank you very much indeed Thank you very much, Tara. A wonderful presentation. And I